This is Neil Pitwari, it's ESE 471, and I'm going to talk in this segment about orthogonality. The last segment was about why we should study orthogonality. In this segment, I'm going to take a more mathematical approach and show you how it works. Two signals, phi1 of t and phi2 of t, are orthogonal if the integral over all time of the product of the two is zero. This is for real signals, so for two real valued signals. And for two complex valued signals, we need to put in a complex conjugate here. Okay, so orthogonal signals, short story, for real valued signals, we just take the product, we integrate it over all time, and we check to see if that integral is zero. Now, we had this example in the last segment of two cosines. One was a signal, and I'm going to call it phi1 of t now, that was cosine of 2 pi t, and another signal that was plotted as a cosine at a higher frequency, that was actually 4 pi t. And this was for t between 0 and 1, and 0 everywhere else. To show if two signals are orthogonal or not, we're going to do just what the definition says. We're going to multiply them together. We're going to integrate over all time. And in this case, this is the integral from 0 to 1, because there's 0 everywhere else. I don't need to integrate there. I'm going to put in the cosine of 2 pi t and the cosine of 4 pi t. I could talk about why this integral is 0. I could go through the math, or I could just show you graphically that the product of the two has an equal part of its signal that is above 0 as the part that's below 0. And graphically, you can see from this plot, uh, which I credit to this website here, I have a cosine in green, another cosine in blue. I take their product, it becomes this yellow signal. And the yellow signal, the area under the curve, uh, has both positive and negative parts, and those parts are equal. So for example, this part is equal to this part, so they would cancel out. This part plus this part is equal to this part, and so these are all going to cancel out. And so we're going to have an integral of zero. So without going into the integral, you can see that these two cosine signals that exist between zero and one are orthogonal. There's no other necessary thing to do to show that they're orthogonal. All you have to do is take the integral of the product and show that it's zero. Let me present two other examples of pairs of signals that are orthogonal. Consider a sinusoid and a cosine at the same frequency. Here, the FC is a carrier frequency. In wireless channels, this is wherever your signal sits in the spectrum. It might be 2.4 gigahertz for Wi-Fi. It might be 1.7 gigahertz for cellular. It might be 100 megahertz for FM radio. T sub s becomes the symbol period, how long you're going to let this signal last, or how often you're going to send different signals. So that's one example. Another example is two cosines at different frequencies. As an example, let's write one cosine at 2 pi fc t and another cosine at 2 pi, but change the frequency by 1 over the symbol period.
what we're going to show is that in this case, we're going to get approximate orthogonality. It won't be exactly zero, but for engineering purposes, it will be approximately zero as long as our carrier frequency is much greater than one over our symbol period. So we're going to have many orders of magnitude difference between these two. Our integral of the product of these two is going to be very, very close to zero. Okay, let's do this example to show that these two cosines at two different frequencies defined between zero and T sub s are orthogonal. So to show orthogonality, we have to take the product of them, multiply them, and show that the integral is zero. Because they're zero elsewhere, we just make the limits of this integral zero and T sub s. And what we need here is our product to sum formulas. And that first one shows that I can take the product of two cosines, we'll present them as the cosine of the difference plus the cosine of the sum. When I take the integral of a cosine, I get a sine divided by the constant multiplying the t, the variable t. And now we have to apply the limits, making little t equal to capital T sub s and zero. And I'll do each term separately. So the first term is going to have this four pi constant on the bottom. We have a sine of 4 pi fc t sub s plus 2 pi because that t here is going to cancel out the t sub s in the bottom when I plug in t sub s. And then on the other side, when I have a 0, it's just going to be sine of 0, which is 0. And then I'm going to have the second term, t sub s over 2 pi, and a sine of, should have been a t here. I'm going to have a sine of 2 pi, because again, the t sub s in the numerator and denominator are going to cancel when I plug in t sub s for a little t. And then I'm going to subtract sine of zero. Okay, every sine of zero is going to be zero. So I'm going to be left with this term that is a sinusoid and also this extra plus two pi doesn't really matter because sine is periodic with a period of two pi. So it's the same as writing this one. Okay, let's evaluate how big this term is. This is going to always be less than or equal to 1 over the denominator, because this sign at most is going to be 1. This term is going to be something like 10 to the 6th for megahertz, 10 to the 9th for gigahertz. So this term is going to be very, very large. So regardless of how big this term is, the symbol rate, this bottom term is going to be very, very large, many orders of magnitude, you know, on the order of 10 to the minus ninth here. And it's going to be very, very close to zero. So essentially what we're going to say is this is approximately orthogonal. That is, these two signals, which we wrote up above here, are approximately orthogonal. 